What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk podcast, a very special episode today, all about Bob Cousy, who turns 95 today. It's kind of crazy to think. 60 years ago, Coos in the famous retirement on the Garden Parquet, uh, the We Love You Coos coming out of the crowd in that moment. And so I got a chance to go out to Bob Cousy's house earlier this week, sit down with him, reflect on uh, pretty much the entirety of of his career and his life his memories his favorite memorabilia which is amazing so first we got to rewind let me tell you the story so uh this is is going to be a very selfish pod because i was born in worcester i live in a neighboring town i've been here my whole life uh much like who's i've endured the long commutes to boston not as long as him there was no mass pike back in the day as he jokes about during the pod and having to make what was sometimes a two-hour commute uh, but Bob Cousy was a rock star in this this part of the world, not only for what he did at Holy Cross and winning a NCAA title in 1947 and winning six titles with the Celtics, but just being, you know, the fact that he that he wanted to live here and stayed here after he retired. Uh, I had some family, as you might you'll hear me detail here, uh, maybe inside the pod that lived up by Bob in Worcester and we would uh, we would be driving home from family gatherings and me as a small child, although it's more funny to think of me at like 20 years old, uh, would run sort of like when I would tell my parents slow so we can go, we can go by Bob Cousy's house and and maybe get a glimpse of him in the yard or, you know, walking by and maybe jumping up on the, the stone wall and being glad that uh, Cousy and his wife did not call the police for the guy who was just trying to catch a glimpse of the Houdini of the hardwood. Uh, and even now up on, 290, the road that sort of, you know, the highway that connects everything from my neck of the woods to Worcester. Uh, there's this giant storage building that has Cousy and his number 14 uh, Holy Cross jersey up on the wall uh, with other iconic Worcester things like Coney Island hot dog and the smiley face that was invented here. So uh, the the legend of Coos was not lost on me growing up and you know, it's easy because there's so much history with the Celtics to to sort of fade into the scenery. And you think about what Russell did and even Tommy winning so many championships. And uh, it's hard to sometimes cut out your your, your little slice. I remember uh, we were trying to, to rank Celtics back during probably during the pandemic. And uh, I'd probably probably more apt to boost Koozie's rating based on my my biases. Uh, but it's a, it's amazing to think what he, what he did uh, the first six of those titles once uh once russell arrived and you know he takes great pride in the fact that that they took the torch from there and went to uh 11 in 13 seasons and uh you'll hear still a little bravado there he's not ready to see that to uh, the warriors or the or the the bulls or or anybody like kuz is uh is really proud of what they did maybe the greatest accomplishment in uh in north american sports uh but it was neat to, to finally get us to step inside Kuz's house. He's got this amazing home office where this just the walls are lined with memorabilia. And you know, most most I would say most players now just have jerseys up on the wall, jersey swaps, autographs, stuff like that. Here's Kuz. He's got the trophy that they just named after him. You'll hear about that in the pod. Uh, his Hall of Fame statue. He's got Presidential Medal of Freedom. I mean, there's 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 pictures with him in presidents on everywhere you turn. Muhammad Ali. They got bobbleheads. For more modern, there's, he's signing Panini cards with diamonds in them. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's remarkable to to reflect on what Kuzi bent to the team, what he meant to, uh, for, for me out here, the city of Worcester. Still might be the uh, the biggest celebrity in Worcester at the moment. And uh, it's just cool to, to hear him reflect on uh, year 95. Doesn't put a big stock in numbers. Uh, can't get around as much as he used to. Uh, can't can't get the garden as much as uh as even ownership would like and steve pakliuka calling him up and wanting him to come visit and uh it's just a little bit too much but uh, i can tell you there's two statues of coups here in worcester one up at holy cross one in front of the dcu center uh the man is a legend and uh excited for you guys to just get a little glimpse into his reflections on his career what you know how he wants to be remembered as a basketball player and uh you know again I remember J.J. Reddick's comments about playing in an era of plumber and fireman fired everybody up a little bit. 
uh, and especially Kuz, and he, he would was quick to remind him that Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell, some other really great players, maybe the the best of the best, were out there at that time. And Kuzi uh, still made some magic happen, especially with his uh, with his ball handling and passing. So let's get right into it. Here's our chat with Bob Kuzi. All right, ninety five. What does that number mean to you? Yeah, well, it's just a number. We've never in our family, frankly, uh, uh, given much time uh, to celebrating birthdays. And unfortunately, at 95, I'm ass deep in them now. My son-in-law, who's visiting, has got his birthday today. I've got mine Wednesday. And my daughter has hers on Friday. So <laughs> I'm going to, I mean, I... Uh, you know, it's 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 a number. I've uh, I've said often over the years. Uh, I am literally the the most fortunate, luckiest sob on the planet. Everything in my life has kind of fallen together. Whether it's faith, hopefully it's a big guy up there watching this interview. <laughs> Uh, or what, but, you know, going through life, all of us have to rely on hopefully good luck or fortune or faith or whatever we want to call it. Most of the bounces have gone my way, and so I sit back and uh, and just think of my how fortunate I've been in having not only a fruitful life, but a... a uh, uh, a productive, interesting life as well in terms of playing a child's game. You know, I played a child's game well. I earned a good living. Steve Pagliuca called the other day, and I was saying to him, so how did, how did, how did it feel signing a $300 million contract the other day? And we laughed about it, and I said, Steve, I'm sorry, I just can't relate to that because mm -hmm. I still remember... A number of years ago, 75 or whatever, going to Waller Brown's office, the owner of the Celtics, and it was crowded, so he said, come on, come on with me, and we went to the men's room. <laughs> and he said to me, Coos, what's it going to take? And I said, Mr. Brown, I need $10,000. <laughs> he said, how about nine? And I said, you got a deal, Mr. Brown, and the rest is history, and six champions... So from that humble, but I, $10,000, I, my last year, they told me I was the highest paid player in the, year, in the league, I made 35000 And, and I, I started, one of the proudest things, one of the things I'm most proud about is starting the Players yes. Association, because that somehow has lent itself 60 years later in terms of the interaction between the players and the owners, players association, to guys signing $300 million contracts for five years of playing a child's game. So I celebrate that, really. I don't, I'm don't. i not sitting here, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pissed off as hell because they're making all that money and I didn't. I, I'm so pleased that I had a hand, I think, some in setting the table for this and especially the, the Players Association, which they have worked together about as effectively mm -hmm. with ownership as any um, American sports uh, team. Did you know that when you were getting involved back oh, then? Oh, no, no. I knew that we were playing <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 23 effing uh, uh, exhibition games before the season. <laughs> We'd play a full college season before... We started playing 82 or whatever it was, 62, then 82, whatever, you know, and that conditions were not harsh, certainly, and hey, we were just, you know, graduating college, someone was willing to pay us anything to play a child's game for a living, otherwise we'd be selling effing insurance like everybody else, and who wanted to do that, you know? So, yes, I was, we, but with all that said, we still needed a conduit, in my judgment, and I was the only one in the 50s, the only one really who was, who was putting asses in seats, but that only meant three or four or five thousand a game. It wasn't sellouts or anything, but I was the only one actually selling, and I was selling them for everybody else as well. 
So I knew I was the only one that they wouldn't retaliate against, or perhaps, you know. So, however, I covered my ass. I went to Walla Brown, who I had a great relationship with, and sat down and said, Mr. Brown, look, you're the best owner in the league. You overpay all of us. But I feel we need representation at the table. And I don't want to do this without your blessing. And he literally gave me his blessing. Because if he just said, Cruz, I don't want you involved in this, I probably would not. I, we, had a, we had a good, solid relationship. I would have certainly taken that into consideration. But anyway, I did because I was the only one that, and I served as the first president for, what, eight years? And, and then I think Tommy got involved, mm. Tommy Heinsohn took over for a year or two or three. Uh, so anyway, yes, that's one, as I said, other than having an exemplary uh, good life and career. And, you know, with all that said, 10,000, 35,000, I mean, I, I'm, I'm basically a, a farmer's son, you know. Uh, my needs never have been, but I'm, I'm kind of, living and I have more than what I might need in my family and so I'm a happy camper uh, so I'm, I'm so pleased that the group of us were able as I said earlier set the table for what now is the second most played sport in the world because you know that's what's happened the mm. sport has exploded and as a result 300 it's generating enough income and I bet if you could get behind closed doors, when the owners in the NBA sit around and split up their promotional dollars, even though football, baseball, I understand that, they're great, the football's the most popular and all this stuff, but basketball is the second most played sport in the world, has become, and I, it may overtake soccer. I don't know, soccer's number one, but it may overtake soccer. And as I say, when the owners sit around in the NBA, I bet they get more for their buck when they split up than any of the mm -hmm. other sports when they split up their promotional dollars, you know. So the, the NBA, uh, in other ways as well, uh, I think uh, have lived happily ever after with the NBA Players Association and conducted their negotiations in a way that they're able to afford three hundred million dollars for five years. I mean it's you can't you can't get your mind around that. But good luck to Jalen. I mean I'm I'm pleased as hell and I read where he's gonna help the world mm -hmm. and save the world and boy does the world ever need saving. So good luck. What would you like what do you think your legacy is in basketball in general and how would you like to you know, how do you want that generation, this new generation, to look back yeah, on? Yeah, I don't know. We're all products of history or, or subject to it. But whatever they say is good. I, I, I would, in defending my position, I would say, and today I had a run-in. I don't know, what was, what's his name from uh, ESPN? J.J. Uh, Riddick? J.J. Riddick, yeah. All right, so six months ago, I don't know, he, he was... He had a question. I guess he's very good. I don't get it. So, but he made some statements about you know uh, today's player and so forth. And in the fifties and sixties, they played the game like they were firemen and plumbers or some such thing. And it made the headlines. And they called me. And in fact, I was doing an interview for NBA. NBA has whatever. And at the end of the interview, he caught me by surprise with it, which was part of the gig, I guess, and said, Coz, uh, one more question. What's your answer to J.J. Mm -hmm. Riddick? And I said, well, I, I, uh, uh, I, I've been told about it. I haven't seen it, but I understand that he said not nasty things, but he said we played the game like plumbers and, and the firemen or something. And I said, if, if what he's saying is today's player in all sports is better. If he'd have called me, I'd have said, absolutely, they're bigger, better, stronger, they shoot it better. I shot at 39% career. I think Curry probably shoots at 44 or 45 from three. So, yeah, in every way. But 
I would have said, however, with that said, if you don't think, you know, and I said, rather than rebut what he said, because people that are, I have found, this is the only nasty thing I said, that are a little down, down in whatever field they're in, a little down below the line, uh, they they look up and say nasty things about people in front of I said, I'm not going to get involved in that game. I will simply note, note some of the plumbers and uh, electricians that I played with. And I said, I'll start with a guy named Bill Russell, who is still the best center in my judgment that's ever played. Elgin Baylor, who I think is the best. Anyway, I reeled off about 30 names. <laughs> All Hall of Famers, you know. Obviously, Havlicek, Sam, Casey, whatever. And I said, if those guys who were plumbers, then I raised my was I was one of the premier. Hopefully, uh, I didn't say this, but in answer to your question, uh, uh, what I would say, uh, all of them were bigger, stronger, better in other ways. I never dunked the ball. I got the top of the rim. That was it. Uh, uh, I would, however, put my creative instincts, my imagination, and and I'd like to give the point guard, like in football, you can't play without an effing quarterback. If, if I were arguing my case in court, I'd mm -hmm. say I'd put my creative instincts uh, against anybody who's ever played the game, frankly. And how I saw the floor, and all we did was run. We didn't have any freaking plays. We had six plays, and if we never called them, Al Back was a happy camper. <laughs> That meant we blew their doors off with the transition game. And that's what, but each time down in transition, the, the, the scenario changes and you, the point guard, have to adjust and do obviously what's best to achieve your goal. Put the ball in the hole, give it to someone, make scores out of the other four people, all that. And so I, I would not take a back seat. I think that obviously was my strength. And it, Where did it you know, come from? Where, where, did, did yeah, the playgrounds in New York. Yeah, I mean, I learned it. I never. I I'd like to say I had a mentor. I only played high school a year and a half, and I wasn't particularly co uh, close to my coach. And he was uh, by the dots. Everything you you pass there and you go there. So there wasn't a lot of creativity involved. College a little different. Buster Sheely at Holy Cross encouraged my unorthodox. Um, Mindset, uh, and then Arnold, uh, Arnold uh, certainly was. You know, if I had played anywhere along the lines for a walk the ball up the floor coach, and as I say, play the game by design, you pass there and you go there, we wouldn't be sitting here mm -hmm. talking. We would have, I would not have been part of six world champions or anything else. I'd have never been with the Celtics. So, again, faith plays a role. In your, in your lifespan. What, uh, so I was telling you, when I, I grew up, I was born in Worcester, grew up in Auburn, I was climbing on your rock wall every chance I got. What, why Worcester? Like, and why did you decide to stay here even when the commute? Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 no, I, I was gonna say I did a defense. I didn't do a, a defense of the city because I, uh, so I had 17 years of little New York City ghetto experience before I got off a train in Worcester on a cloudy, a rainy Saturday, found my way somehow up to Holy Cross uh, and got to this town of Worcester. And uh, I, I was always, I liked people in small groups. I never liked them in large groups. I don't want to seem unrealistic, but I've I've enjoyed my notoriety. I, mm -hmm. you know, I still get up until a few weeks or thirty letters a day, fan mail and stuff. So, and that smooths your ego or strokes your ego. That's nice. Yeah, I I played a child's game quite well for a living. Got to the right place at the right time with about other eight or. Hall of Famers, plus a guy named Russell who kind of capped it all, and the result was, you know, six uh, championships, 
teams that I, but 11 out of 13, the most amazing feat ever in my judgment accomplished in any American team professional uh, sport. Uh, so, uh, so I I enjoy notoriety. Although I lived in Worcester, all the time I played, uh, people have said to me for forty freaking years, so, you know, because we bought, I think, well, we're thirty-five years in broadcasting and thirteen with the sellers. And why do you live in Worcester? Because there was no mass pike in those days. So sometimes it was most of the time two-hour joint, and I would look forward to getting, when I was the man, look forward to getting out of the city on Route 9, <laughs> home. I didn't have this place at the time, but uh, 63, yeah, I retired. Anyway, get behind the walls that you were peeking over mm -hmm. <laughs> and lock the door and not answer the doorbell or the phone, and I do the same thing now. <laughs> uh, so as I say, I like people in small groups, never in large, and so I was more than happy to pay that price mm -hmm. for 40 years because I didn't have to do all that shit that I would have had to do in the Boston area, appearance here, appearance, and I paid my dues. Mm -hmm. I, I paid my dues in Worcester uh, to this day. And, uh, but it wouldn't have been like Boston. My privacy, my daughters went, my Marie, my oldest, walked through the bushes to go to Notre Dame Academy. They both had normal, everyday high school experiences. They weren't harassed in any way. Hey, yo, Bob Cody's daughter, you know. So they lived normal lives. My wife, all of us, we went to dinner and nobody bothered you. I mean, it. so privacy is still... Uh, so people will say, well, you're weird. You know, it's the rest of the world. That's, uh, that's okay. And I'm all right with that. But so anyway, Worcester, and in my judgment, Worcester's won the All-American City mm -hmm. six times. What does that trophy mean to you? You were talking, you were joking with us before we started that, you know, it showed up in a big box and you were worried about it. Maybe it was ticking. Well, it, it, it allows me to be part of the legacy of this wonderful uh, league and sport that I was involved in intimately for 30 years, or still am in, in some ways. So, uh, yeah, it, it gives me a place in history. Hopefully the league will stay alive and, and uh, the Celtics will be able to... Uh, they won it the first year, which mm -hmm. thrilled me, and, uh, and I thought was going to win it back to back. So. Uh, so it's it's significant in what we remember. What old farts do, because as we sit every night for an hour or two and meditate about the good things, I block out all the negative things and I focus on the good things and uh, that will be part of the good things. I asked you when we first got here what your favorite memorabilia is. There's so much to, to kind of go over. You, you went immediately to the, the Medal of Freedom. You know, what else jumps out to you? when you scour your room? Oh dear, I, it's, it's a collage of, of a lifetime. So, uh, as I say, all we have left at this point is our imagination to bring us to where we want and this helps bring me to where I, I need. It's an ego thing, you know, but it's, it's, I lived it, as I've already said, I'm the luckiest SOB in the world and uh, so I focus on other things. That's what I was glad that today's player in the form of Jalen Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I watched the press conference and most, uh, most of his remarks were focused on what he was going to do, the good he was going to do. He's obviously interested in racial issues. Uh, it, it's always been, I've, I've never been a soapbox guy, but I've, I've, I've devoted to this day, a lot of time, I still, believe it or not, I'm out hawking myself. I'm doing a J.J. Buffett, or what's it, Buffett who sells. I sell an hour of my time for 25000 to a good cause. I've been involved with Big Brother, Big Sisters all my life. There's another Jesuit-related school, and, and schools where the Jesuits have a college, they start a nativity school for kids 
uh, sixth to eighth grade uh, inner city kids who can't afford mm -hmm. and whatever, who can academically qualify for college. So these are all kids that are going to go to college that normally wouldn't, only 60 of them. So from its inception about 25 years ago, I've been involved in different ways with Nativity School. And I've given them an auction item, for instance, to sell the last couple of years if they can sell it for 25000 So the donor, last year, Big Brother, Big Sister made 65000 So that was good. So I'm 95, got one foot in the grave, and uh, if there is a big basketball court in the sky, I'll let you guys know about it first. Uh, <laughs> I'll soon be, I'm in double overtime, I think, so. Well, let's end on that. What is the, what's the secret? Like, what what is, what is part of your daily routine still that has helped you get to this point? Yeah, no, no, I don't know. No extremes, obviously. Hey, I love. We do our old man Thursday night dinner mm -hmm. at the club every Thursday. I have my two beef eaters, and uh, then Saturdays, my bride and I used to go to dinner every Saturday, and so I still to this day, and I recommend to people who have lost spouses that they had a good relationship with. Her portrait is in the dining room there, and when I'm alone especially, I walk by on Saturday, I say, sweetheart, time for you and I to have our pops. <laughs> I have a couple of beef eaters, and that's the extent of my alcohol intake. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a little white wine, a glass of white wine or something, but I, a hard liquor, that's about it. Uh, I've always done my exercising, mm -hmm. Jesus. Uh, I've always said, what well, was required? And up to a year ago, I was doing the bike. I got a stationary bike in there. I was doing the bike. Before that, I was walking around the island. You just went by yeah. a dozen times a day with a cane. But I was, so I, I've done, you know, well, it's been necessary to stay inside. Do you call that good living or it's normal? That's what, if you want, <laughs> I, I smoke cigars. My, my, I can thank my buddy Arnold for that for 20 years. Uh, I had to protect myself against him because he and I went to Europe together. We traveled the world on three different occasions, and I'd have to combat his freaking cigar smoke. So I became a cigar smoker for uh, about 20 years, but then I... I gave it up cold turkey. Uh, I didn't inhale, so I guess I didn't do any damage to the lungs. So that type of, you call that clean living? I don't know, Just it's mm -hmm. just intelligent living if you're, if you're concerned about how your longevity, <laughs> you're a lot, you need a lot of other things to go well also, Chris, but uh, that's a good start anyway. All right, I'm still kinda kind of glowing it was cool to just get to sit down there and uh i think appropriately he gave us about 95 minutes of stories and uh, we had to we had to trim it down there maybe stash some stuff for for later in the year about the upcoming team and uh but like it i just was it was really cool to hear about it. some of the stuff I, I i knew the general story of uh of of him being drafted by tri-cities i'd never stopped to think that i i did not know what the troy the the, the, the tri-cities were uh, in Illinois at that point, uh, Moline, Illinois, I believe it is. And, uh, so it was, it was neat to hear how he, he wasn't going to give up his driver's school in Worcester to, uh, to go venture out there. Not at, not at, uh, less than $10,000 a year. Uh, but Coos deserves a lot of credit. It's nice to see him back in the headlines too, as the first president of the, uh, NBA players association and getting that off the ground and leading to, what was happening now with Jalen Brown getting $304 million over five years. And it would be easy for someone who made $35,000 in their last season to be uh, a little jealous or resentful. And Kuz is just the opposite. It's uh, it's part of his legacy, uh, helping to pave the way and make sure that other players uh, got that and that they got fair treatment for, for the, for, 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 for the way the game has exploded. And uh, he's eager to see it. Now, the only thing I would, I would caution, no, like, Kuz really wants to see one more. Maybe that's the way, only way we could convince him to get out there to Boston because the, the, the mobility is low and he's, it would take a lot to get him get him out there uh, and yet to maybe help pull another banner to the Garden Rafters, put him up there, put another one up with the six that he helped and the uh, the 11 that Russell did, and uh, maybe that would be enough. So uh, no pressure Celtics, but 
maybe the best birthday present you can give Bob Cousy is to uh, to eliminate some of the inconsistencies from last year and uh, find a way to get to that championship finish line. All right. Still got a little while here before we're back into real basketball, but uh, enjoy your summer, everybody. We'll uh, we'll pop in here and there, but go like, subscribe, check us out on the YouTube page. We'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk Podcast. <laughs>